This should reflect a new item 10.1. It's related to a budget request for FY26 related to the re-timing of the education grant process. Bryce and Hetty will cover that in detail in that line item 10.1. Thank you very much. Um, could we uh, move to item number three, approval of the meeting minutes? Do we have a motion? So moved. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, very good. Thanks, everyone. Um, let's go to item 3.1 for the uh, CAB and staff workshop. I see action needed on that. Is there something we need to do? For the minutes. Approval of the minutes. Oh, just the approval of the minutes for the workshop. Okay, thank you. Make a you. motion to approve the minutes of the workshop. Thank you, Steve. Is there a second? Second. Great. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Okay, very good. Let's go to board member reports. Um, Steve, would you like to start us off? Sure. I don't have a whole lot. I just wanted to recap what I've told uh, a few times in the, in the past meetings. CAOA held some training. It was hosted in Colorado Springs there at the airport. Uh, it was a basic and advanced airport safety operations specialist or ASOS uh, class. They had 48 people that were able to attend from Colorado airports at no cost other than the travel if they needed to travel. And I just kind of wanted to point out that, you know, it was successful, but once again, I think they used uh, some of the grant funding for that kind of training. And it just really pays off for airports, that many people being able to attend when it would typically be prohibited for, for some of them to, to do if they had to go out of state to take the training. Uh, the only other thing I had was um, Ken Lawson with Colorado Airport Operators Association. He is kind of trying to back out. He's been the business manager for them for probably close to 10 years now. Done a great job. Uh, handled conferences, building, just tons of, of really good work that he's done. Uh, he's trying to back away from that and handing off to a new person that we've got. Erin Hoban, and she is there's but she'll, she'll be taking on some of the duties that Ken has been doing, so if anybody needs to coordinate with him, uh, there will be a new contact to add to that. He's not just washing his hands and walking away, thank goodness. He's been transitioning now for <coughs> at least six months or more, planning it longer, but uh, really, I think, appreciating his efforts over the years, so we'll hopefully see him anyway at the, at the conferences sometimes. And then the last thing, just an update again, at Denver International, we've been planning to transition from the old PFAS foam, uh, AFFF, to uh, fluorine-free foam. Uh, that was a lot more complex for us than we expected, uh, but we're finally next week going to start that process. We don't know exactly how long it'll take, but it'll be probably, uh, we're hoping to be done with all of the, the transition by uh, mid-February or so. Wow. So it's just kind of a good sign, I think, that, that we are making progress. And again, thank, thanks for that, uh, uh, the help really from the state, aeronautics and the uh, Department of, um, what is it, D uh, Public Health and Environment. Yeah, yes, exactly. Thanks. Um, <laughs> they're providing uh, funding for some of that transition. It makes a world of difference. So, thanks. That's my report. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. All right. Great. Thank you. So, I, as I've done, um, I, I think um, in, in most of the recent uh, or meetings, I make a comment about what's happening with unleaded, uh, the move to unleaded uh, AVGAS. And since our last board meeting, uh, one significant uh, event has happened. Swift Fuels received an STC uh, for its 100R, so the first 100 octane. I think that's a, I think it's a 100 on and 105 octane uh, fuel. Now that's only for, it's specific to 
uh, Cessna 172 Skyhawks, um, both um, both the R and S model, um, with uh, Lycoming specific engine Lycoming IO 360 um, L2A. So it's very narrow, but uh, but the first uh, STC for a Swift underloaded product is out. Um, and you know, as we all know, that um, uh, Gammy um, has received their STC for um, to be for their fuel to be used in any um, any spark ignition piston engine that's in the fleet. However, because they're resident to um, uh, go down the a uh, ASTM certification pathway, uh, that's slowing their acceptance in the industry and um, there's, on the distribution side. So. That's still happening, and um, Londell, uh, Bessel, and the BP Racing Fuel testing that's happening with the FAA PAFI program I'm just proceeding to the, uh, what I heard um, just recently is going well. Uh, but that's um, you know that's going to move into 2025 before it comes out of coming out of PAFI. So a little bit of progress, but things are things are still going on. Uh, second thing that I wanted to report and talk about, it, and I think many people know this, uh, but it is relevant to us in, in Colorado, and that is um, two of the uh, association leaders that we all know uh, very well are retiring. So Mark Baker um, from AOPA um, announced earlier this year, announced his uh, intent to retire, said that he would stay on until, uh, um, until a replacement was selected, and that's happened. Um, on the 26th of September, AOPA announced uh, Darren Pleasance uh, to replace him. I know Darren well. He's um, uh, we're to, on the EAA board together. We're on the uh, finance committee together. Uh, Darren comes from the Cisco Systems, where uh, he ran the accelerates uh, their acceleration center for accelerating technology, um, and then before that, he was a partner with McKinsey and company in their high tech sector. So, but um, he's, a, he's an aviation guy like the rest of us. He owns a Piper Meridian. He's got an RD6 and he's got a C-Ray Amphib that he flies. He's also a current CFI. So he steps into some big shoes to fill for, you know, with Mark Baker, um, but comes with a really good resume and, uh, um, and some really strong business sense and I think that's going to help AOPA. And then the other uh, leader that's uh, it's not formally announced, but it's uh, pretty well known that Pete Bunce from uh, General Aviation Manufacturer Association is going to retire. He's, he will finish his 20-year uh, career with um, as the CEO of Gamma um, next April. Uh, there hasn't been an announcement yet um, we, for, uh, for who is going to see them. They're down to the last three people. We had an event, uh, Gamma had an event that I attended um, with the Recreation Aviation Foundation last month in uh, Minnesota, and they did the three interviews there. Although they sequestered them, we have no idea who the three are. doesn't know who the three are. We, you know, we couldn't see. <laughs> they did it off site, but anyway, they're getting, getting close to that. So, um, speaking of Gamma, uh, there's a uh, Something for, again, especially for anybody listening on the phone, but for um, local high schools in your area, uh, Gamma has a, um, an event every year called the Aviation Design Challenge. Um, it's been going on for the last 13 years. Um, that um, uh, registration for that program opened yesterday and runs through um, the let's see, runs through December 20th, and it's for high schools that have. Um, uh, aviation programs or aviation clubs or engineering clubs. Um, it, it's uh, it's open to the first 150 uh, high schools uh, that enter, and it's a six-week program. The program comes from Gamma, um, so it takes four to six weeks for this, these teams to go through, um, and then they submit their um, submit their project and um, other requirements to Gamma, and Gamma makes a selection, and then the Winning team um, gets an all-expense paid general aviation experience. Um, this year it'll be at Cub Crafters Manufacturing. They'll go up to Cub Crafters for a week, and the industry will uh, will pay for all their expenses. Second place team gets a um, 
a Redbird Flight Stem Lab system, which is pretty good. And the third place team gets one year of four flights <laughs> subscription. But um, the nice thing about this, and I've been involved with this from 2013, so the first uh, first six years or seven years, we built airplanes. Um, the Glass Air Sportsman has a two week to taxi, and so those kids would come up and do that. So we built eight airplanes over seven years. But but I like this so. Over its third, you know, since 2013, they've had 900 teams participate, 475 high schools around the country from all 50 states. <clears throat> so um, it's really a, so if you know a high school of a high school that has a program, I might be interested. And it doesn't have to be aviation. If you know, it can be STEM, it can be engineering, it can be any of those things. Um, send them off to uh, the Gamma website, and there's information there on how they. How they can register, um, and one more, th one more thing. Speaking of, of Pete Bunce, he uh, he was out two weeks ago and, and stayed at the house. We went down to the Navy Air Force game, which was all Navy. But, uh, <laughs> but on Sunday, we got in my sportsman, and um, he hadn't been in Leadville, so we flew him up to Leadville to get his certificate. And when we were walking in, there was a giant um, snow broom. Um, that was there, and so I told Pete, you know, Caitlin, about the program. You know, and that it just happened. And when we walked in the door, I made, mentioned that to the gentleman behind the counter, and it, they're all excited because they're, they've they're getting another piece from from um, this year's uh, auction. But you know, congratulations to you. I mean, that that's such a great program. You know, and to fly into an airport like Leadville and see this giant piece of equipment, you know, knowing that it was affordable. Now, Leadville's crew car leaves something to be desired. So <laughs> did, did you have the van? We had the van. <laughs> so, um, it, it, um, so I think that's report. So anyway, that's that's my report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Trimby? Um, do those high schools change up every year? Like, they're not usually the same high school every year that gets the, uh, um, gets the award? It, well, if, what do you get? You get it's 100 every year they do get 150 schools that apply so so no it's it's always uh usually it's a different high school but it's a very objective process that they have to go through so no, it's not subjective they they have to do a simulation and and gamma provides the simu simulator for them to use so the, the high school gets the highest score on that is you know it's pretty objective. are you part of the judging process no no I'm long <laughs> <out of that. laughs> Were you ever part of the judging process? Um, no, <laughs> I, I tried to stay away from that. But but I flew my sportsman up every year to give the kids who were building the airplane a ride because they the airplane taxis in two weeks they don't get to see it fly. So so, so we put them in you know other sportsmen and gave them a chance to fly. But it was great. My my sportsman was built in 2013 with eight high school kids, so had 900 hours, and hasn't fallen apart yet. <laughs> Okay, so I think it's my turn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm the state representative for the pilot organizations, and I'm going to give the report starting with Colorado Pilots Association. The Colorado Pilots Association has th currently 731 members, and let's see, they had a scholarship fund for 2025 um, that was donated from the U.S. Air Force Academy flying team of nearly $11,000, which I thought was pretty cool. And being that we're here in the U.S. Air Force Academy territory, that's really, really cool. We're, they're lucky to get that. Um, the final mountain flying course uh, for 2024 was on September 21st, and Bill Stanford reports that of uh, all his courses combined, 100 pilots were trained to fly in the mountains this year. And that doesn't even include him being at EAA, Air Venture. Uh, let's see, the Colorado Pots Association holiday party is December 8th at Buffalo Run in Commerce City. And the CPA presents flight safety expert Mike Kosielniak offered a tour on August 28th of Kappa Tower with 39 people going up in the tower in small groups and they got to meet an ATC specialist for Q&A and a slideshow. On September 23rd, the Colorado Pilots Association presented a designated pilot examiner at DPE town hall. And five DPEs were from Colorado, one was from Wyoming and uh, they were both fixed wing and rotary designated pilot examiners. And then the CT CPA continues to attend the local airport noise roundtables and pilot controller safety meetings 
at uh, uh, Broomfield and Rock Mountain Metro. I mean, uh, Centennial. Women in Aviation Mile High Chapter held their biggest ever GAD this year, which Girls in Aviation Day. There's a couple cute pictures up there. Those are my two favorite out of all the pictures that Anna Byers sent me, uh, Stephen Byers, like Anna Byers. Um, just super cute, super cute little, little girls there. And Hetty, you were there. I wasn't able to be there because it was my son's homecoming game. But uh, Hetty was there. You can probably vouch that it was probably one of the biggest Girls in Aviation Days ever that women in aviation had over at Wings Over the Rockies. Um, and thanks again, Wings Over the Rockies, for hosting. But oh, that um, one was actually at uh, Shelter. Oh, right, at Shelter. Yeah, that's right. So thank you to Shelter this year. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, and you had your flight simulator there, Hetty, which was awesome. So that's a couple pictures of that. Um, let's see. Thursday, November 14th is their holiday party at Flight Code Tower. It's the third year there now. And they're going to give away a scholarship for conference registration, which happens to be in Denver this year at the Gaylord. And they also gave away a $3,000 scholarship recently. Uh, award. Uh, I don't know who the person who won it is. Uh, let's see. Colorado Aviation Business Association just held a social last Thursday at Flight Co. And they had a booth at the Longmont Air Show on September 14th. And um, September 14th was also a Challenge Air event at Modern Aviation at Centennial. And some of the CABA and CPA pilots were there flying uh, children with disabilities. Really great day. Um, the CABA holiday party is December 5th. And a lot of the proceeds from that um, will go to uh, Colorado's military veterans. Looking at you all, thank you. Um, Kava scholarships are due November are due December thirty first. They do offer the scholarships. Um, they're offering one scholarship for each of the following: a professional pilot, an aircraft maintenance repair avionics technician, and professional development in aviation management and operations, uh, which most like Kenny and Dave. A lot of people in the room uh, would be from that background. Um, and then new this year, they are partnering with Flight Safety International to offer two more scholarships. And those are for initial airframe technician certificate and an initial SIC citation type rating. And then, of course, we can't forget that CABA has their huge legislature, legislative involvement. Um, and they're always working extremely well with National Business uh, Aviation Association, uh, NBAA. Um, EAA, Boulder EAA 1627 had a $100 hamburger fly-in for only $10. <laughs> in August, September, and last weekend, the last week uh, at Journeys Aviation in Boulder. And then the EAA Granby chapter, uh, this was a while back, back in July, but they had the Mountain Pancake fly-in at Emily Warner Field. And then Longmont also had their pancake fly-in in June. So it's always just great to see that they're holding all these fly-ins at this time of year. And um, EAA 301 had theirs in April here at this airport. So always great to know that they're, they're offering those pancake fly-ins and $10 hamburgers, um, which are usually 100 Owen. Usually when people do cross countries and they go someplace, they want to get a burger and it costs them a lot of money because <laughs> the fuel to get there to get that burger was actually a lot of money. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I think it's now like three hundred dollars. Three hundred dollars more. There is inflation. Or you just don't get the burger. Yeah. <laughs> so, Glass of water, please. Go. Yeah. <laughs> Colorado ninety nines. Um, just you guys. I didn't know. If, I didn't know this, but for the longest time, the ninety nines were the largest ninety nines oh. in the country. Oh. And. Um, yeah, Jan just told everybody that they are no longer the number one largest 99s in the country. San Diego has beat them out. So we need more Colorado 99s members so we can get back up to lead, lead the way. Um, let's see, they did the poker run and many of the pilots for Colorado 99s flew and volunteered at the poker run. And they also went out to Ray for the bruising cues on October 5th. I saw Terry Fiala's pictures. She's always looking cool in her double shot of whiskey airplane. <laughs> you guys know, you know, the double shot of whiskey airplane. Uh, let's see, they participated in the Longmont Air Show September 14th. And uh, 
they oftentimes fly to the wings over the Rockies, pancake breakfasts every Saturday too. Um, it's pretty cool. Um, they gave away three Ruel Awards recently for scholarships, and they're going to give another one called First Wings Award um, very soon. Those were due on October 1st. Uh, commemorative Air Force hosted with Shelter at KBJC an 80s cover band event which was pretty great uh, turnout on September 6th. They, I guess they had a bigger turnout than they thought they would have. <laughs> so if they just keep doing that, that'd be, that'd be great. I'll go ahead next year. All right, and then uh, the next one, I'm almost done, the Civil Air Patrol. So they have over 3,000 powered air flights for, September, uh, for 2024 so far, and that's up almost 10% from last year. And the cadet orientation flight activity accounts for 25% of all of their powered flights. And that includes Civil Air Patrol, Air Force ROTC, and Junior Air Force ROTC. So that makes up about a quarter of their entire flight um, in the powered aircraft, and uh, which was 800 flights, flight hours so far in 2025. The Colorado wing of the Civil Air Patrol just held a conference and awards banquet in Colorado Springs, September 13th through the 15th. And on August 15th and 16th, they held a Colorado Wing Mission Pilot Mountains Search Clinic at Boulder Airport. And their incident management team deployed four Civil Air Patrol aircraft and 12 mission pilot trainers to the classroom there to give some classroom instruction on mountainous area search and rescue techniques and mountain safety flying um, and techniques. Um, Colorado Aviation Historical Society, Bill Dunn was elected to the Colorado Aviation I didn't know that. Historical That's Society cool. Aviation Hall of Fame. Excellent. So that is news from That's the Aviation cool. Historical Society. Um, no report for Colorado Agricultural Aviation Association or the Colorado Seaplane Association. And finally, um, Colorado Airport Operators Association, um, they are having their winter conference in Denver in January, and then in Steamboat Springs in June. And I believe that finishes my report. Thank you, Trudy. Any questions? If anybody oh. ever needs names, contacts, websites, <coughs> you know, and I can put you uh, in touch with a person. Trudy? Yes. When do the Kaba Scholarships close? Kaba Scholarships. December 31st. Okay, thank you. Okay, real quick, I, I just have a couple of, there's uh, some interesting announcements in air service. Uh, congratulations to Angela at Grand Junction. Uh, Delta's coming back going to Salt Lake, uh, or uh, the Salt Lake flight, uh, so congratulations. And um, they currently also have Breeze flying uh, into Grand Junction as well. Uh, Montrose, uh, this winter, starting this winter, Breeze will be flying into Montrose. So congratulations to Montrose uh, with their service. and. Um, Locally, I just thought I'd kind of follow up on a couple of things happening at Telluride. Um, uh, if re you recall the last meeting we talked about it. We had a uh, aircraft enter our EMAS off the end of the runway. Telluride's the only airport uh, in the Northwest region that has EMAS, Engineered Manufactured Arresting System, which is basically like a runaway truck ramp off the end of the ramp. And it's been there for 15 years. And it's just so we have a maximum length. We're sitting on a Mesa. And so that's how we're able to get a 7,100 foot long runway um, for departures. And uh, Hawker on July 20th um, aborted departure and um, entered the north edge of the EMAS. Took out 230 EMAS blocks, which are about four by four blocks that are 20 inches thick. And it's like a porous concrete. And uh, the interesting thing, we, we uh, the FAA is there to help us, and they reminded us that we had 45 days to get it fixed. <laughs> uh, so, but the team Runway Safe did a hell of a job. They came in uh, a few weeks ago, and they completed the repair of the EMAS, and it only cost $1.1 million to repair that. So, hell of a deal. Thank God for insurance. Uh, the expectation, of course, is that the uh, operator's insurance will cover that, but it did save, probably save some severe injury or uh, what have you, because off the end of the runway, uh, about another 500 feet would have been um, about a 1600 foot drop off that Mesa, the Mesa. So 
Um, that and then uh, our hangar is uh, well under construction. We're a little over a third completed. Um, I guess you could say the hole is is fully dug out and there's uh, three sides about 15 foot high concrete walls and we're looking forward to going vertical with steel um, in about two or three weeks. So the hope is, is that we'll still have it topped off uh, cover at least uh, for the winter by I would say the first week or so of December. So things apparently start to happen fast. And then finally, I thought this is, you guys would get a kick out of this. So you do get some interesting visitors um, from the film industry. And um, of course, you know, with Telluride's location, it's kind of a prime spot. And we had a visitor last week from Sphere Studios uh, from Los Angeles, but they are the ones you know, uh, that have the equipment, uh, 16K camera that shoots those amazing uh, videos that you see at the Sphere in Las Vegas. Oh, no way. Cool. So they rented, basically rented hangar space um, in uh, A-Star, and there's a, a, the camera is mounted on the front, 16K. It's the only one in the world that shoots that. So it'll be uh, fascinating. It's a, uh, it definitely is, the, the camera was probably worth more than the helicopter. Wow. wow, it's flying. So it's it's quite amazing. So you think this technology is so new? Um, you know, they had a client that actually originally requested this, um, but they're going to keep it in their library. So you never know. You might go to Sphere and it might be incorporating some of their uh, showings, uh, some of their video footage on the inside of the Sphere. I, I was asked, is this the inside or the outside of the Sphere? And they said, no, no, this is inside. That's the the 16K quality. The outside's only 4K. <laughs> so, so yeah, so it's just a, a amazing thing. And the nice thing about it is when you do have that those kind of special events, we do charge. Um, and so we make a little bit of money as we get into our slower season. So that's all I have, Mr. Chair. Sean, you're not getting a 16K camera. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Daniel? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm going to be pretty brief. I've been so buried in projects at the airport that I have not been able to uh, reach out to uh, my airports like I'd like to. Um, and and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit when we get into the uh, um, the portion of the, uh, what's it called, the airport updates, the new, the new piece? Is that what it's called? Hold on just a second. I got to, I want to share a picture in if I can put it on the right screen, gotta love technology. <laughs> I feel it. <you>, <laughs> and yeah. I can't see my screen. Is it? Uh, are you seeing the picture up on the screen? It's good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I uh, at the at our last meeting, I had mentioned how appreciative uh, I was talking to um, uh, Akron uh, about the Crackville program and and. We have used it a couple of times now, but I, I just wanted to I put this picture up here because this entire picture was possible with grant funding. Thank you, State Aeronautics, for that. And this is obviously wearing my airport manager hat for the moment. Um, but we, uh, while the runway is closed for the, for the new taxiway project, we decided to grab one of the crack fill machines and some material and do some crack fill, which is about as fun uh, as it gets when it comes to uh, doing anything outdoors, when oh. every piece of the equipment is 400 degrees and it's, uh, <laughs> it's, but I'm so appreciative. So in this picture, you've got this grant state grant funded pickup with a state provided crack fill truck or trailer filled with grant funded crack fill material. And one of the greatest things about this, which makes it hard for anybody to say no to keeping up with their runway maintenance is the fact that, this gets so cheap for the airports that, you know, we obviously live and die by our, um, by our, our budgets. And it's such a small amount that it doesn't require prior budgeting to be able to say, okay, I think I'm going to go out and do some grant or some crack film. You know, this, I think we just bought one pallet of it and I forget what the match was, but it was like less than $200. So it, it allows us the autonomy to be able to go do this anytime it's convenient and not have to think about it a year ahead of time to try to fit it into our budget. So I want to tell you how super appreciative we are, everybody out here for this. This particular machine came from Lamar, um, but uh, it's uh, it's an amazing um, program and uh, there's no reason to not do it, so. So Daniel, um, 
if it was between cracked fill or pulling snakes out of Air Force One. <laughs> yeah. I would I would kiss a snake uh, to avoid doing crack fill. <laughs> So it's uh, the, just the nature of it. It's smelly. It's hot. It's uh, it's it's a lot of work. Yeah. And, you know, our runway is actually in pretty good shape. As you can see in the picture, it's about ready for another fog seal. But um, we didn't have to do a ton. It wasn't like we were painting the whole runway with it. But it's a lot of work. And uh, out here in Burlington, we do our own tricks. We we are the staff from bottom to top. So we're the ones out there in the in the pickup running the crack fill machine. I would have to say in this picture, that's my assistant running it, but I do promise I was running the machine and letting him drive at some point. Um, so, <laughs> so that's, that's uh, one of the reasons I, my report is so abbreviated is because we we're trying to cram a bunch of projects in while the runway's closed and, and knock some things out. And, uh, but uh, once we get to the airport um, updates, we'll talk about everything we've got going on. So that's all I have. Daniel, I have a question. Uh-huh. How many high How many high schoolers have come out to uh, use your flight simulator at the airport so far? You know, uh, this year we don't get a ton of high school kids. It, uh, it seems like it's cutting off um, around middle school. I'm I'm trying to entice some more high school kids, but we've had K through eighth grade is typically I would say most all of it, and I'm trying to figure out how to get some more high school kids that are. You know, you're getting into that age where you're too cool for doing, you know, field trips and stuff. And um, I am trying to figure out how to target the high school kids a little bit more to come out and try it. I have a high schooler in the room here today that could probably drive out to your airport. You can show them how to fly it. Well, <laughs> send that high schooler out. We, right. we hear he likes crack filling, too. <laughs> hey, we, we can give them the full, the full airport manager. We'll let them sign a million dollar contract we'll let him scrub the toilets do some electrical work <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of everything <laughs> oh, uh, love it yeah <laughs> thank you daniel um, thanks. uh for my report uh, i'll keep it brief uh just uh couldn't be happier to hear about glenwood springs and so glad that dave and sean were able to uh, participate in the event where here we were just a few short years ago, the, the runway was at risk, the airport was at risk, and uh, things have turned a corner in a very positive way, and just uh, thrilled to hear about that. Um, and I, I might also uh, transition us to uh, remembrance of a former chair of the Aeronautical Board, uh, Robert Oleslager, who we sadly lost uh, this last month. Um, uh, if uh, if everyone could share some thoughts and and, uh, and stories about Robert, um, uh, maybe we can start, Steve, with you. Sure. Yeah. So I think uh, Robert knew a ton of people, but I guess one thing that I would mention that uh, really struck me from the very first time I ever met him was what he supported, which was the the intern program over at Centennial. I mean, there were so many people that, that have been through there. Now, you can find them everywhere. They're here. They're at Denver International Airport. I work for one. I've got people to work for me. Um, but it's just a, a really has always been an impressive thing. And for him to just spend the time that it takes to go out and, and deal with those, those folks. And not only that, but teach them. He, I know... Um, was able to see uh, just the way that he spent time and actually helped them to learn the business and get into airport management. So that's, I'll just leave it at that, but uh, definitely a striking person. Uh, uh, Going to be missed by a lot of people. So Steve makes a, a, a great note about uh, uh, about Robert W. His giving a time because he was always so passionate that was, on what's going on around him, and particularly th those events at uh, at Centennial Airport. So, um, on, on a Saturday when we would be flying Young Eagles or Challenger, uh, he would show up just to, to see what was going on and to lend any support. And, 
Um, so it, this is a million years ago, but I was flying, um, I was flying Challenge Air, and, and Robert was there, and I had a, a, a ten-year-old, or they, they brought in a, a ten-year-old autistic young man. It was pretty animated, and Robert and I were talking, and this was the next person I was going to fly. So Robert helped me put the young man in the airplane and get him comfortable, and we went off and flew, and then came, and came back, um, and it was lunchtime. So, um, so we sat down with this young man and um, and his mother to have a hot dog. I, I, I think I don't remember who, remember who was providing hot dogs at lunch, but so we sat down to have lunch. And um, this this young man whispered to his something to his mother. His mother said he wants to know if he could touch your mustache. <laughs> so I didn't have I didn't have the uh, I didn't have the beard, but I had this big mustache. So this young man was like Braille. He touched my mustache. And Robert's watching that thing. He couldn't get over it. So after that, any time that I'd be talking to somebody, Robert would come up and say, ask him if he could touch your mustache. <laughs> <laughs> and he would introduce me to the people and go, he'll, t he'll let you touch his mustache. So, uh, but, that, but that was Robert. He was there always for everybody. I didn't know Robert. Kidding? You know, I just, I, I think, um, I always look at him, he's a great mentor for me in my career, and I think so many other people in this room. Um, generous with his time. And one of the reasons why I always looked up to him as a mentor is I was always fascinated at the level he, as a CEO of uh, Centennial, I just think it was, uh, I think when you go into new organizations, one of the things I always look at is I always look at what kind of succession plan do they have, what kind of how are their employees? What's their turnover rates or whatever? And I think Centennial, um, during his tenure, obviously he had a hell of a succession plan. You know, Mike Frontefell, who was able to take over as it should be. That's the ideal, you know. And he's left on his terms. Not a lot of airport managers can say they live on their own terms. They're usually asked to leave. Um, so so he, he, he was that. But the reason why he was so uh, highly regarded by not only people that work for him, uh, as well as the community around the airport, is he, he always he always made sure that his house was in order. In other words, uh, when you when you're somebody like that, you you get the national exposure, which he did. Um, he he was well regarded through in the national AAAE. Um, but an indication is that he he earned awards from you know the local uh, chamber, the chapters, you know economic development or what have you. So that that's a man that knew how to prioritize his. His leadership and to be such a star for that long in a place like Centennial Airport is just an amazing thing. So, so that's those are the best things that I will always uh, uh, remember. But you know, I mean, I remember starting at Jeffco um, when I was it became I was really terrified to actually become the airport manager. I thought I had the best job in the world. I was going to be the number two guy, and um, call I called him just to get his advice, and he just just. Plenty of time for me, you know, and just good words. So, and there was something about flip flops and uh, polo yes. shirts. So the best thing that I always loved when I first, when you go to these big national conferences and you have hundreds of people, uh, you go to these welcoming ceremonies or what have you, and and Robert was always known for his Hawaiian shirts or his uh, golf shirts with the shorts and the flip flops, you know, and and just such a welcome, friendly. And you could pick. You could pick, oh, there's Robert, you know. So, uh, yeah, it's just, it just, that's just his personality. And his, you know? the collar was always oh, up. Yeah, and the collar. I always always up, up on his collar. Yeah, he always had his collar up, and he just had his own style, and, uh, yeah, you just want to kind of keep that going. Very nice. Uh, Daniel, anything from you? Unfortunately, like Trimby, I, I never had the opportunity to meet him, but, man, I sure love hearing all these stories. It sounds like he was larger-than-life character. Mm. Uh, Dave, any comments from you or staff? You know, I'll, I'll keep it short from my end. You know, unlike I look across the room over here at several of my counterparts that worked for Robert when he was the director at Centennial. I never had that privilege because I had left Centennial and moved on before he got hired. But, you know, he served on this board from 2014 to 2020 and chair in 2020 during a pretty tough time, if you all remember what that year was like. Um, but, you know, for me and I think for the whole team, you know, I knew Robert long before I came to this role about 10 years ago. But when I came to this role, the visions 
circumstances were a little bleak and you know Robert was uh, part of the selection committee and I got to know him there and he was very much a mentor and a counselor I think for all of us as we navigated our way out of um, you know the situation the previous folks had put us in but he was just an amazing guy and I've, I, I, I tried not to tear up but you know I drank beer at Brussels with him I did all these great things played golf incredible places worked with him on this board and it just it really broke our heart I think everybody in our team because there's five of us that worked at Centennial on his mark on that airport and really our industry in the entire world is pretty remarkable. So it was an honor and a privilege to know him and we're going to miss him. So um, with that, I'll remind you, I think I sent you all the invite November 8th at um, Wings Over the Rockies at Centennial. There'll be a memorial for him. So if you didn't get that, please let me know and I'll make sure you get that email. And in that invite, it said, wear your best. Sure. Exactly. So anyway, that's the pop collars. We couldn't quite get away with flip flops today, but <laughs> yeah. maybe, uh, maybe on the eighth. So thank you. Sure. Would anyone else like to mention a few words? Walt, anything? Oh, <clears throat> it take me a while to compose it. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I'm marvelous. Mr. Chair, I think if you don't mind, please. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess haven't heard what you all said. I obviously echo everything everybody has said, but Dave just made me think when he said that a lot of us didn't work under Robert, but me and Todd spent five years working for him at Centennial, and that's where we started our internships, and that's where we got to see firsthand for a long time everything everybody knows and has said about him, about his mentorship. His door was always open. He would drop anything he was doing on a dime to hear your concerns, help you out. And I got that from him and I had the pleasure to work with him obviously here when he was on the board as well. And I guess one memorable moment that uh, I always appreciated was when I worked at Centennial, um, he got through one of his many connections, uh, a seat on the B-17 aluminum overcast when it was at Centennial. And he just gave it to me because he's like, yeah, I've flown on it before. And that was, that was pretty cool. That was exciting. Wow. So, yeah. so. How nice. Great. Please. Uh, and I just have a brief thing as well. Um, I retired from the Air Force in 2014 and had to transition from the military to the civilian world. Uh, went to Metro, graduated, uh, finished my degree, and then uh, needed work. And I uh, was very, very fortunate to get that internship at Centennial Airport. And of course, I was 53 years old when uh, I applied for that job. So I was their oldest uh, <laughs> intern by far. <laughs> And so that, of course, uh, attracted the attention of Robert. He wanted to know why is this crusty old guy <laughs> in there being an intern. And so, um, uh, and so he understood when I explained to him, I'm transitioning, I'm trying to put food on the table, I want to do something meaningful with my life. And uh, he was incredibly supportive and uh, very, very kind the whole time uh, that I, I worked there almost the entire, I, I finished uh, virtually an entire year of internship there. And uh, he knew very well that I very much wanted to come work for the division uh, while I was there. Uh, just, I don't know what it was, but there happened to be an opening available for uh, this place. And uh, he uh, wrote an unsolicited uh, letter of recommendation for me on my behalf to uh, help me get over here. So I think he had a very direct impact on the welfare of uh, my family and I. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Thank you for sharing. Sean? You know, I, I didn't have an opportunity to work with Robert one-on-one um, -on -one like these guys had, but um, he actually came on to Centennial Airport about two weeks before I got this job. And uh, if anybody, Dave, you might remember, but there was this uh, in the ops area where I was in operations, was a huge mural of <clears throat> like a Lear 45 uh, cockpit panel there, and I just loved it. I would sit there in my shifts and just like study it and stare at it. And Robert had started, and I came in for a shift one day, and that mural was gone. And I'm like, what the heck happened to that? And Lori's like, yeah, Robert. Robert made us take it down. And I'm like, what in the heck? <laughs> but that, you know, if anybody knows Robert well enough, and if you go over to Centennial Airport's admin building, mm -hmm. He had a vision for classy looking stuff, and that was not in his vision, apparently. <laughs> um, and, you know, he really, that was a big, big part of what Robert had was, was presentation. And so um, I think we can all recognize that that was a big, big thing for him. So anyway, just kind of a funny 
anecdotal story. He didn't give it to you? No, what? I think they threw in the trash, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say that we all knew Robert is, you know, if we all were able to, if we weren't on the clock, it would be raising a toast of Chardonnay with ice in it, uh, which was called Bobby O, I think is what they called it, but uh, that was his drink of choice. So I guess here's to Robert Ola Sliders. <laughs> Okay, thanks everyone. Um, let's move to airport updates. Do not have Randy Hayes on here. Okay. So, I go for that too. If you want to go for it? All right, uh, Mr. Chair, I guess we're waiting on Akron to join online, but uh, in lieu of that, I'll go ahead and uh, I'm going to provide an update on behalf of Tony Vicari, the aviation director for Durango La Plata County Airport. He couldn't make it today, but he wanted to let us know or let you know about an exciting project that uh, has pretty much broken ground. I guess it started. I, don't, I couldn't tell you that they broke the ground yet, but as you know, or if you don't, this year phase 1A of their terminal expansion was completed. Dave and I had the privilege to go out and visit that uh, grand opening. It was pretty interesting. They added a gate during that um, expansion. But one of the tougher projects that they're going to be starting is phase 1B of their terminal expansion and renovation. Um, I guess I've got his letter here. It was fully broke around on October 2nd. Uh, the project will add nearly 20,000 square feet of new space to the terminal and renovate an additional 20,000 square feet of existing space. It's the most expensive capital project in the history of the airport at $28.5 million. And the project funding includes, as you all know, $8 million from the SIB loan that uh, you all approved earlier this year. And um, also of note, his airline passenger traffic is up 16% um, from 2023 through August. And 24 is forecast to be uh, the busiest airline traffic of the year all time with over 240,000 in plane passengers. So a much needed terminal expansion. Um, and I believe it's supposed to be completed in 20, late 26. Great. We're looking forward to attending that opening as well. Thank you, Scott. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have Randy? He is not on okay. with us at all, but I do have Kevin Booth there. Kevin, do you want to go Great. ahead and share your your screen? Sure. Uh, let me know if you can see that. Got it. All right, very good. Well, thanks for the opportunity. Um, Again, my name is Kevin Booth, uh, airport director here at the Yampa Valley Regional Airport in Hayden, Colorado, um, just west of Steamboat Springs. And I'm not going to give you an overall update on the on the airport. There's a lot to talk about there, but uh, I wanted to focus on one particular project that we have ongoing, and that's our aviation business park. So the slide you see here calls out two business parks in yellow uh, font. Uh, one is uh, sponsored by the town of Hayden, and our airport sits in the city limits of the town of Hayden, as most of you may know. Um, but the one we're going to uh, concentrate on is what we're calling our aviation business park. Um, and like I said, that's ongoing. So I'll get a here's a blow up of uh, our concept for that. And if you can see my cursor, um, I will show you that uh, this is our FBO, Atlantic Aviation is our one and only FBO on airport. Uh, they own these two hangars. These four along Taxiway Bravo are privately owned. Um, this hangar is under construction today as are these. And this is phase one of our aviation business park. And it's being built inside what was our uh, security fence uh, and our borders. But uh, in the... Uh, Blue and red font on the right side of the slide and the arrows will point out that what we've already done in 2023 was reroute a county road um, to bring all this property inside of our new uh, perimeter fence. That brings in, it's a total of a 37 acre property, but it's got wetlands in it. So there's really about 27 acres that can be developed and there's a lot of interest in it. Um, so, um, we are, and I didn't make this up, but we're the fastest growing regional airport in Colorado that came out in the CAOA um, conference in Vail recently. Um, by a lot, and our employments like Tony's in, in Durango have gone up significantly from about 100,000 in 20 
19 to right now we're projecting for 2024, 238,000. So over 100% increase in employments. And that's not why we're doing this business park. Um, we're doing the, the business park because we're an underutilized on the GA side and business aviation side. We're underutilized and we don't have the facilities that we need. There's demand. Uh, there's demand here. There's demand at the, the GA airport in Steamboat for hangars. Um, we also are a coal impacted community. So what we've seen here is an opportunity to build a business park to um, go ahead and try and attract some aviation related businesses inside the business park. So that's that's our goal is to bring good paying jobs and businesses on airport. Um, this depiction shows you uh, in pink what's being built today. They're forming grade beams today and they'll be pouring concrete here in a week or so. Um, this taxiway Bravo exists, um, but it's an ADG2, so it's not big enough to handle the kind of airplanes that we typically see here. So the project that we're specifically asking for uh, help with funding wise is to widen and strengthen the existing taxiway Bravo to bring it up to ADG3 uh, specs, and then to build this taxi lane Foxtrot here, which will help us attract businesses and give them direct access to our runway complex. Okay. Um, we're doing this primarily with funding, uh, grant funding that's on request with EDA. We have uh, indications that it will be approved. Um, and we should find out in November or December. Um, the Office of Just Transition, because we are a coal impacted community, is also um, got a grant application in with them. And then I just met with Dola earlier today and they're looking at providing some funding as well. Um, my specific ask, I'll, I'll get to here in a little bit, but <clears throat> EA will not pay for construction admin. They don't consider that to be part of uh, construction costs. I'm not sure why. I don't necessarily <laughs> agree with that, but uh, it's, a, it's a must have and it's potentially about a half a million dollars. Um, we have all kinds of interest here. I've got developers that want to come in and build, and um, I'll show you basically the artist's concept of what we hope to build and what our RFP will support is this will be in the next RFP, this section here to the north, right? These will all have direct access, kind of through the fence access, um, and that's why it's got a big parking lot. So we really want to target businesses coming in here and we have an MRO, a maintenance repair and overhaul organization already signed on with a beneficiary letter. Um, and that's Vantage Aviation. They're an East Coast based company. Um, they do FBO, they do ground handling, fueling, servicing, um, and MRO uh, services. Um, we also have got indications that, uh, of interest in charter, rental, sales, avionics, paint, aircraft assembly even. Um, and we do have service from the UPS and FedEx on a daily basis. So I would be shocked if they don't move their uh, their operation into this area. Because um, right now they're doing uh, swaps out on the apron in the winter. Um, here's a little more about the beneficiary that we have signed on. Um, they expect to invest about $25 million, uh, in the facility, bring uh, a number of jobs uh, a lot of them are really good paying jobs. So a total of 45 new direct jobs. And I won't bore you with all the numbers there, but uh, these are good paying jobs. Uh, and a lot of them are above the average mean income here in the Valley. The other part of this project that I'm really excited about is our, our uh, partnership with um, Colorado Northwestern Community College in Rangeley, right? So as you are probably very familiar they have a great maintenance technology program there. I've been out and um, did some speaking there last March um, at their first annual air summit. Uh, I met with their um, director of aviation technology. And then uh, we also met with uh, Vantage Aviation and both sides are very excited. So um, CNCC would like to open a satellite campus on our airport. Uh, in conjunction with Vantage Aviation. Vantage Aviation is more than willing to let them do like night classes and host internships for uh, A&P mechanics that are in training 
And CNCC is thinking about adding uh, an extra semester for the students that would be interested in doing an internship. And then some of these night classes would also help us. Um, we've got a lot of coal mine jobs and uh, power plant, uh, coal fired power plant jobs with employees that are having to transition and would really like to stay. And a lot of the skill sets in those plants um, would transfer over to the aviation uh, career field. So very excited to have that happen. Um, this is kind of the ask we have for DOLA. Um, and some of this will be paid by the Economic Development Administration, a federal grant. Um, and that's where the gap lies. So it's, uh, it's these other architectural and engineering fees that uh, we think EDA will not will not pay for. And so uh, we brought this up. I brought this up. It came up in our uh, CIP meetings with the FAA and um, our CDOT uh, partners there uh, a week or so ago. And um, I wanted to bring it to your attention. So that's the project. That's the ask. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that uh, we're also, like Tony and Durango, uh, under design now to expand our terminal, um, adding four gates, three or four jet bridges, um, re revamping our baggage handling um, and revamping our, some of our apron stuff. So um, we're well underway with that and that's a high priority for us as well. So I will stop there and see if that brought any questions to mind for the group. Questions for Kevin? Uh, which planner mostly works with Kevin? Scott. Scott. Great. Very interesting. Thank you and awesome, best Kevin. of luck. Yeah, thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, um, I know we have the next one up here is the Grand Junction Airport video, but Daniel Malia uh, would like to join us again and present a few things as well. You ready to go there, Daniel? If I can get my picture to load, I will be ready. How about there? Are you seeing it? Coming up shortly, hopefully. There it is. There it is. Yeah. Hey, there's some technology that worked today. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate you letting me talk. We've got so much, uh, so much going on at the, the Burlington Airport um, this fall, and it's all kind of happening at the same time with our, our generator project. We're also getting new runway end identifier lights. Steve, if you want to call dibs on some of the old ones, I will throw them in the back of my pickup for you next time I come up. <laughs> if you can think of a way to make one into a, a coffee table. <laughs> I can do that. Do you want it still to strobe with that six inch diameter strobe light or no? <laughs> that could be fun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can, uh, yeah, you actually see it right there in that image. One of the ones that's getting replaced there. Um, but no, we're 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 just cruising along on our um, on our uh, project here with the uh, so to to refresh you, I've mentioned this before to you that that aren't dealing with me on a regular basis is so we're basically replacing all the taxiways that are the old existing taxiways at the airport. So we've got three connectors and then the the Alpha, which is about a half half runway length Alpha taxiway. And uh, it's uh, we just started our first pour this week, uh, and they got done and enough to get out of the uh, the object free area um, just yesterday. So that this morning we were able to get the the runway back open, but they're going to proceed back down. Alpha, everything's going smooth. It's just a ton of work, and then they have to contend with forty mile an hour winds and thirty five degree temperatures. So they don't get started as early as they'd want, and it's uh, just the typical stuff. But it's going really well so far. Uh, one of the things that our airport has been grandfathered into um, the old system of uh, basically we had our Alpha 3 connector went straight from the runway to the ramp, which is a big no-no now. So as part of this, that Alpha 3 taxiway is going to get removed and then uh, moved about 500 feet to the north. So we've got that in process as well. Everything looks like it's on schedule. Looks like our generator is going to be here in about two weeks for the for that project, and uh, be a an excellent safety enhancement at the airport to to have that. Does anybody have any questions on uh, anything going on at Burlington? All right. You take that picture with your drone. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> 
I, I have that thing in my pickup at all times, just in case. You never know. Uh, by the way, when I took this picture, it was gusting to 38 miles an hour. Wow. Holy so it was, uh, it doesn't look that pristine and calm. I mean, it does in the picture, but it sure was not. Mm-hmm. So. <laughs> Great report. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. All right, and we do have a video to show. Now, I can't make any promises here. We're having some serious issues with audio echoing and stuff, so we'll give it a try, but if you get some echoes, I apologize. We'll be getting this video out um, on YouTube and in our Mountain Bay News Bulletin, too, so you'll, there will be no problem to see it. Um, and this is in regards to we, Dave. Uh, myself, Hetty, and Melody went out to Grand Junction on Monday to celebrate with the airport on the return of Delta Airlines, which is operated by SkyWest Airlines. And um, and I'll just go ahead and have the video tell you what's happening here. So let's give this a try. Grand Junction Regional Airport announced the return of an old friend back to the airport. This morning, SkyWest Airlines flew out from St. George to announce the return of the Delta connection from Grand Junction to Salt Lake City. Salt Lake City is Delta's western hub, so we can fly directly to, to Salt, Lake Salt Lake City, and we can also connect to 97 destinations beyond Salt Lake City. We are thrilled to be here in Grand Junction to Grand Junction to Salt Lake City on Delta. Uh, those flights are going to be coming back December 3rd. It's the first time they'll be back in a couple of years. Beginning on December Year, Delta Airlines, operated by Sky West Airlines, will once again be a non stop flight. Uh, sorry. For Delta Salt Lake City. Um, and I'm excited to be with you to celebrate this return air service connection to Western Colorado, especially here in Grand Junction, where we are a hub of connectivity for the Western Slope and the broader region. This comes following continued support from U.S. Senators Michael Bennett and John Hickenlooper, as well as the approval from Grand Junction's Airport Authority Board, amending the airport's air service development grant, supporting the restoration of Delta's air service to Colorado's busiest Western Slope Airport. It was a huge team that worked on this. This wouldn't be possible without the support of the Grand Junction Regional Airport Authority Board, the Grand Junction Regional Air Service Alliance, our partners at the U.S. Department of Transportation, who quickly approved uh, an amendment to the scope of an air service development grant that we received back in 2020. According to the division's 2020 Colorado Aviation Economic Impact Study, Grand Junction Regional Airport generated nearly three quarters of a billion dollars in overall business revenue. With the addition of Delta's service and record passenger growth, this figure is only expected to be on the rise. That study demonstrated that this airport for this region and all of Colorado creates almost 3,400 direct and indirect jobs on the payroll of over $180 million with a total economic impact of almost three quarters of a billion, with a B, billion dollars. Yeah, so the, the estimated local economic impact of this service alone is $34 million to the Grand Junction economy. And so here at the airport, you know, we have nearly a $1 billion annual economic impact locally, and this will just further add to that and really support the robust and thriving economy that we have here in Grand Junction. So it really is the perfect time to fly right from Grand Junction Regional Airport because it's it's convenient, it's easy, and you can get really anywhere around the globe. There you go, quick and dirty. All right. Sorry about the audio issues there. That's good. So I think that will conclude the airport reports unless and I don't see Randy on here. Let me see. I don't think he's going to come on. No. I yeah. tried to prompt him. In. Okay. All right. So I think that's it. Sure. Thank you, Sean. Um, we'll go to public comments. Uh, public comments will be limited to three minutes each. Uh, do we have any public comments? None in Zoom land. Okay. All right. Um, we'll move along to the director's report. Dave. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. You've already touched on it a little bit earlier, but uh, as you noted on September 28th, Sean and I had the opportunity to participate in the rededication of the Glenwood Springs Airport, uh, which is pretty remarkable given that just a couple of years ago that airport was under pressure for reuse. Um, but uh, uh, unfortunately, it took a couple of wildfires to, I think, uh, get the community to recognize the importance of that airport because that, that was a key facility in the helicopter operation for both the Lake Christine and the Grizzly Creek fires there. So we're very happy with that. Uh, we're also very happy to see Amy Helm, who had been the airport director there about three years ago, um, who was fantastic. She had relocated to New Zealand with her husband for work. She came back. She's now the airport director again in Glenwood, which is fantastic. We love working with her and um, um, her and the new group, Summers Air Park. They are the group that's actually operating and maintaining the airport under a long-term lease with the city of, of uh, Glenwood Springs. So great path forward uh, for them. And uh, I would point out, though, that although Summers Air Park is operating the airport, our grants and all of our responsibilities with those are still vested with the city of Glenwood. It's the owner of the airport. So anyway, pretty exciting to see that. I know, Walt, that's one of your favorite airports in the state. So uh, we were happy. We were thinking about you while we were up there uh, here about three weeks ago. Thank so you. it was very cool. Uh, on September 27th, uh, 17th, excuse me, Todd and the planning team, I'm sorry, Todd's not here, he's on vacation this week, but uh, uh, we held our annual airport capital improvement planning workshop where airports are provided with all of the information they need for the upcoming year's grant program, both from us and from the FAA. We do that collaboratively. Um, it was pretty cool. This was the first year since the pandemic we did that in person as everybody around the state's now been, of course, back uh, to travel. So it was great to see everybody in person. And of course, we always host it virtually as well we did so even before the pandemic so in all we had about 70 attendees 13 airports uh, online 19 <coughs> representatives from eight consulting firms so good to see all of them and i see a few of them here on the zoom meeting today um, always a great opportunity for us to get on the same page as we get ready for our grant program so we'll look forward to it the team putting that together. And then just as a reminder, as we always do, the state and local grants will be presented to you all for review at the December 11th meeting and for action at the January 28th, 2025 meeting. And then we'll present to you the federal matching grants uh, at our meeting in April. So that's just a quick little look ahead on the, the grant program. Uh, Sean, if you go to the next slide, I um, wanna give a shout out to Kip in his amazing work with FAA and Bill Dunn. It's so cool to see him in the Colorado Aviation Hall of Fame because he was a big part of making this happen. But um, just a reminder that, you know, a few months ago we worked to become the first state outside of Alaska to put VFR waypoints on our sectional chart with FAA to improve mountain flying safety so pilots knew exactly where the entrance uh, and the exit to the passes were. So we got 10 of those put on earlier this year, and then we've worked to add uh, another 10. I won't read those off to you there, but um, the other thing we, we recognized in working with Bill Stanifer with Colorado Pilots and the FAA, there's actually those four passes on the bottom are not currently on the FAA sectional, but were identified by the pilot community as some passes that folks use a lot. We ought to get them on there. So with our next uh, implementation and the next chart cycle, you will see Cerro Summit, Cottonwood North, Dallas Divide, and Douglas passes not only on the sectional, but also with the new VFR waypoints. So that'll bring us up to 20. And I think, Kip, I think that's probably where we're gonna be for a little bit. I think we've identified the 20. There's a lot of them we're not gonna put on there that pilots shouldn't be using like Independence Pass and Loveland Pass and some of these other ones that are just not that great. So um, cool safety improvement. I can't believe how fast Bill and the FA yes. got this done. He did all the hard work <laughs> and, uh, and then he just kind of plopped it in my lab and said, here, you're welcome to submit it on behalf of the state. And uh, so, yes, this is the, uh, the final round of uh, mountain passes. And then the, the final step that we're going to do is uh, put some uh, little caution boxes on the uh, sectionals and that will refer to some notes in the back of the big uh, airport chart supplement book. And so then that'll close out the project. So they've been incredibly selfless, especially Bill Dunn, uh, with their time over at uh, Colorado Pilots Association to get this done. They were very excited to get it done. I, I used it last weekend going up through uh, Leadville for Wilkerson. Well, it was awesome. great. It was, nice. it, was in, it was in the Garmin uh, database and came right up. And Excellent. Meeting. Excellent. Meeting. Yeah. Fine. Thank, thank you. That was a big improvement. Is that what job. you have up right there, Mark? What's that? Is that what you have up there? Yeah. I, I do. Is that four flight? It is four flight. It's in four flight, too. And that concludes my report, Mr. Chair. Great. Thank you, Dave. Let's go to the financial update. Price? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, 
Just jump right into it here. First slide shows our September revenue coming in at 3.2 million. That was 63% of forecast of 5.2 million. Obvious question is, where the heck's the rest of our revenue price? What are we doing here? <laughs> uh, when we sent this out, and this is the second month in a row, we've been well under forecast. Uh, I mentioned last month, because I had the data at the time, I didn't at the time this was put, I do now. Uh, United has changed uh, their fuel provider at Denver International. They are getting fuel now from Phillips 66 and Sinclair. Mm -hmm. So we are missing the United, the typical United filings, which this month would be usually anywhere between two and three million per month. Biggest, biggest vendor of the biggest pie. So uh, certainly seeing that effect here, uh, United, or Phillips 66 and Sinclair and United, nobody's figured out yet who's doing the filings and paying, paying everything and reporting everything. So I've been working with the DOR. Uh, I was kind of on them, hey, what's going on? What's going on? And, and they finally found, found some information on it. So we are working with them to get that solved. It's something we do see typically when somebody switches fuel providers. Usually it's a lower impact one, obviously, so it's more of a footnote than a whole topic of conversation, but uh, obviously being united, uh, we're waiting on that. So nothing to worry about as far as the lack of revenue, which, I mean, is always my first 63%. That's pretty terrible. Uh, but uh, because of that, this is also typically the time I revise our forecast for the year. I'm not changing anything right now because I need to see the actual data. I suspect we're pretty much right on pace of where we should be based on historical numbers. Uh, but I'm just kind of pushing that off here uh, until we get that. I don't know when we will see that hit our account. Uh, so for forecasting room for it, I'm just acting as though we're going to see every month in the month it should be there, and I'll keep you guys updated. We will see probably a rather large spike one of these months when we get an extra, like I said, between four and six million uh, just on the last two months. So. It will show up, nothing to be concerned about there as far as uh, overexposing yourself with, with their commitments and stuff. It's just waiting for this to hit. Uh, going way back in the division's history, this had happened with United back in 2008, and it was never really caught as far as, hey, what's going on? And that's when one recession had hit, and the division would have been in trouble except, oh, here's $10 million to catch everything up kind of thing. So. This is a similar situation, it's just it's the biggest impact, so we're obviously seeing it very directly on here rather than So, so Bryce, how much time goes by before we send a Google Beetle? <laughs> <laughs> I've already, I've already uh, sicked the DOR on them to, to get this resolved, uh, and, and they're working on it there. They've got a new analyst in there who was, was a little confused why I was, I was squawking a little bit saying, hey, this is not right. <laughs> Uh, but they're, they've contacted uh, all three. I'm hoping that we see it caught up this month just because I like nice clean reports, obviously. Uh, but kind of at the mercy uh, of that, of just getting it uh, finalized there. But nothing to, to really be worried about. It's just, you know, like I said, the biggest one. So we, we see the impact of that. But uh, way to be on top of it. It's coming. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I remember 2008. Kind of like Santa Claus all of a sudden appeared. Yep. <laughs> so, I mean, we're going to get a nice check here at some point, but we also know about it. We're not worried about the lack of revenue and having to panic and make adjustments or anything like that. So, uh, again, year to date, we're at 11.3 million. Uh, the forecast is 57 million. Uh, next slide. Uh, just our cash balance. Uh, again, we finished September at 26.9 billion uh, in the bank, which was a 300,000 decrease uh, from August. Uh, the cash drop was expected. Uh, dual months of missing VOR payments, a little revenue boost. Yeah, to most of it goes right out, but it was expected. Uh, you know, we're probably going to have a somewhat flat cash balance here until we start seeing some significant drawdowns uh, from the grants that are out and what's going out. So. Nothing out uh, of the ordinary here, projecting a drop uh, to $26.2 million uh, in October, so about a $700,000 drop this month. Again, that'll change if we get the, the check from United, but uh, overall, healthy, where we need to be, nothing to, to be concerned about. Uh, next slide here. Uh, we sent out $2.3 million in disbursements in September, uh, 2.1 of which was sales tax, $198,000 for uh, excise on the abjet side, and $17,000 for excise on the uh, gas side, following the month-to-month -month revenue trends, uh, again, lower than where it would be normally, uh, just because of United. 
Uh, next slide is our contingency balance. Uh, again, we see these numbers dropping here. That is expected as we walk through in detail at the cap meeting in August. Uh, we still have a very healthy, healthy cash balance, as you can see. We are projecting it's going to drop through the years as we get a lot of those payments on grants uh, coming through, uh, both for the ones that we contracted this year and previous years, which were at nice high amounts as well. So cash balance is coming down, kind of into that range that it needs to be. We are where we figured we would be uh, cash-wise, uh, contingency-wise, so we remain uh, healthy. Uh, price of fuel, uh, most of the month has been bouncing around 70 ish dollars. Uh, our worst case number is 45, uh, so we're well above that. As we've, I'll talk about the next slide here, but fuel flow uh, remains very healthy in Denver as well, uh, which is the other key aspect to our contingency analysis. Next slide is the admin expenses. Uh, Mandated caps, 2.7 million for FY24. Uh, Y'all had approved uh, 845,000. Uh, last year we came in at 968,000 uh, as we had a few other uh, divisional uh, projections in there. Uh, and then again, we are on pace to finish at 1.6% of revenue uh, in our budget for admin, well below the 5% cap. So we're trending right up pace right where we figured we would be. And final slide for this month is our fuel flowage slide uh, at Denver. Uh, the flowage in September was 45.3 million gallons, highest September on record. That's six straight months of all-time monthly highs uh, at Denver. Uh, it was down 12% from August, 46.8 million gallons, up 5% from September 2023. Uh, the numbers were down. Um, the forecast, the actuals came in 1% lower than the forecast, so it was, it was pretty much bang on uh, what we were expecting there. Again, the, the thing to point out as you look at that graph there, the, the month over month trends are remarkably consistent uh, at Denver, what we see. So anytime we get a new data point, it projects uh, the revenue and stuff uh, out into the future, the fuel flow and things like that. That's how we can catch something so brutally obvious when we get a filing like we had that was short of revenue. And, Without a doubt, it was easy to pinpoint where it was without even seeing the report. So, uh, again, fuel flow there remains healthy as one of, if not the key driver of, of our revenue. That keeps us in a great standpoint. Uh, and we're projecting, uh, I think the forecast for October was 45.7 million gallons, which would, I know a broken record here, be another record. Uh, at, for, it would be a record for October uh, at Denver. Uh, and we usually do see a little bit of a bump here, which is what this would represent. We've begun to plan our travel around your fuel fluid. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you can tell the months that are lighter, but I mean, it is remarkable how consistent they are, uh, the month over month trends. And that just gives us a really great data point to forecast revenue off of. So it makes my job a lot easier. Great. Happy to answer any questions on any of the board house. That's good. Thank you, Bryce. Okay. Okay, let's move on to administrative updates. Okay. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, Sarah Holsinger and uh, members of the board. Uh, just have a very brief grant administrative update to give you. The first item is uh, for Colorado Plains Regional Airport out at uh, Akron. They requested a supplemental uh, grant of, to, uh, and they were administratively approved to amend grant 24AK002 with an additional $4,043 in state funds to match uh, some extra uh, bipartisan infrastructure law funding coming from the FAA. Uh, this was used to remedy a capital deficit uh, so they complete their uh, terminal Aver construction project that's uh, going on right now. The next one is a new intern grant request and that is coming from uh, Durango La Plata County Airport. This uh, grant request is for $11,440, and this is for uh, this is to help the airport to hire one candidate to, to participate in the airport's uh, airport operations internship program that will last for up to six months. And the vision is providing 50% match on a $22 per hour wage, and that's that. Any questions? Great, thank you, Ken. 
Okay, let's move on to uh, 2024 strategic plan, Dave. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this action is requesting the board's formal adoption of our division's updated 2024 strategic plan, which is uh, the culmination of a four month effort with our stakeholders, users, CAB, and the division to update our previous 2021 plan. So, just by matter of background, back in 2018, uh, you all adopted the division's first ever strategic plan, which to this day has always been developed in collaboration with our stakeholders. And it develops, as you know, a logical, disciplined, and collaborative uh, structure to set out the mission, vision, goals, objectives, and action plans that drive the day-to-day -day governance, operations, and management of our division. And of course, we all know state statute requires us to do certain things like have a discretionary aviation grant program and promote aviation safety uh, and do aviation education. But within those parameters, you all have a lot of discretion on how you allocate policy and funding and everything else. So um, this plan has typically given us a lot of guidance, both you as the board and us as the staff on what we're focused on for the next three year period. So we're excited to do that. Um, I will point out that this was really an update of our 2021 plan. Our mission and vision statements and our value statements did not change. Everybody has been very passionate, I think, about those um, being, being great reflectors of what we do. So um, for us, again, it's a planning tool, it's a management tool, and of course it's a communications tool because what we have typically done over the last six years is twice a year we report out to you and our stakeholders, uh, typically at the Colorado Airport Operators Association meetings on how we're doing, what we're working on. Sometimes we found out things we wanted to do aren't even feasible, so sometimes that happens with these. But um, the strategic plan was included in your packet. We don't have any slides up here for that today, but um, I would point out that um, based on all of the, the input from all of the folks, and that included uh, groups from the Pilots Association, the Aeronautical Board, the FAA, um, our team participated in all of that. We really have focused on four primary goals to look at over the next three years. And the first one, of course, um, as we've talked about, is making sure that we implement all of the requirements of the House Bill 1235 legislation, starting with the 2025 grant program, making sure that we adhere uh, to all the parameters of that, and then making sure that we communicate and articulate uh, what we're doing with that to make sure everybody knows how we're moving forward with that. Um, the second part of that that uh, everybody thought was very important, as you all know, uh, that legislation will add two new community people, uh, folks to this board in December. And we really want to leverage those new folks to help our outreach to community groups and help folks understand what we're uh, what we're doing. And uh, we'll look forward to making that happen as well. Um, one that has been a perennial since the very beginning is making sure that we're paying attention to opportunities to expand and uh, maybe develop new statewide um, initiatives that have benefits to our aviation systems, you know, like our surplus equipment program that Caitlin's going to talk about, wildlife hazard, all those kinds of things. What new things or what enhancements to our existing programs could we do? Um, I'll give you a little sneak preview. One of the objectives under that that we're excited about is Sean and Hetty. Um, are, are well underway with exploring the development of a division uh, mobile application where it would have our airport directory and some other safety things in it. We've gotten the permission from CDOT to develop our own app, which is cool. So that's going to be one of the examples you'll see as a new statewide initiative. And we're kind of excited to see what they come up with. It's going to be really cool. Um, and then the last one, uh, of course, that's really important, I'll talk a little bit about it, is we're about to the end of our 2024 um, uh, partnership study with the National Renewable Energy Lab on alternatively powered aircraft. Um, when we kicked that off about 18 months ago, one of the first deliverables was a list of the current technologies and the current aircraft and all of those things that were in the pipeline. It's amazing what's changed in the last 18 months, um, notably Universal Hydrogen that was developing a hydrogen power dash eight went out of business. So there's a lot of changes that are going to update that for us. And then in the next um, eight weeks, I expect to have a draft of that report to run past all of you to see what you all think, and then hopefully we'll get that finalized early next year, and then the strategic plan will use that and help us inform some of the next steps that we can do, whether that's policy, funding, uh, follow-on studies, partnerships, whatever. We really want to focus on how we leverage these new technologies for the benefit of everybody. So those are really the four uh, primary uh, goals that are in the next 2024 strategic plan that we've put in before you for um, your adoption. Great. Questions for Dave? All right. Um, let's move on to item 10. I'm just sorry, Mr. Chair, we actually need approval of the Oh, I'm sorry. And we can get your um, final adoption of that. That would be amazing. Yes. I'll make a motion that we adopt the updated uh, strategic plan. I'll second it. Great. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 
Great. Thank you. Okay, Patty. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I will be looking for a motion to approve the Aviation Education and Workforce Development Grant Program Manual Update, and that'll be version 2024-A. So this, uh, it's got a little bit hard to see, but um, since the reintroduction of the education grant program, um, we've always set the funding level at January, um, and we've opened up the grant applications in March, closed them in May, looked for approval from the CAB in June, and then started grant contracting in July, which is right in the middle of um, outreach season, if you will. Um, <laughs> It is also when most schools are out. Um, it's summer break and it's harder to get um, the ears of administration and teachers. And so um, we are looking to change the timeline of the grant cycle um, starting in August, setting the uh, funding level, opening up applications in October, closing in December, and then at the um, CAOA conference in January is when we would ask for CAB approval of those, and then we could start the actual um, uh, contracting in February. So that'll be pretty much in the middle of the school year. Um, it will be when the quote unquote outreach season will have slowed quite a bit. Um, I did get feedback from both teachers and administration they kind of liked that fall into spring timeline as well because they're looking then towards the next school year um, for planning purposes. And so their fiscal year actually falls in line with ours. Um, it starts and ends um, July 1st. So once we get everything contracted and executed, then they can look starting in July and August to actually purchase equipment, so on and so forth. So. Um, that is the biggest change to the, uh, the grant manual. Um, it's also worth noting that in order to contract the grants in a timely manner, we are also asking the applicants return their grant assurance signed within 90 days or they will forfeit their um, grant. So, so we are recommending approval of the Aviation Education and Workforce Development Grant Manual Update 2024-A. Very good. So I'd like to make that motion. I'll second that. Great. Any discussion? Uh, it's, the timing, you know, so speaking as a, as a school board treasurer, that's a big, that's a big deal because it lets us. Yes. <laughs> a lot more time. Lot of school, so. Yes. And I would add uh, one of the other changes we made uh, that's in there, it's administrative, is that we've given recipients 90 days to execute their grants. Poor Hetty was having a hard time chasing down some people that were taking a long time to execute their grants, which causes problems on our back end and, yeah. and some of those. So uh, we have to take our money a little quicker now. <laughs> take it. <laughs> You're probably going to get more questions and probably some more grants too. So yes, grant requests. Hopefully. Uh, you'll be yeah. busy. Yes. Yep. Yes. Good. And that's great because then when you're doing your outreach and your outreach busy season, you can talk to people about the grants that you have just awarded. Correct. And then that will be reopening those applications in October. So, yeah. Very good. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Hetty. Um, let's move on <laughs> right to education outreach. Uh, so this is where we get uh, the 10.1, the agenda uh, amendment on here. Uh, this one here is the, uh, I'm looking for approval uh, for the budget updates uh, for the education workforce development uh, program that Hedy just talked about, uh, because we already have FY25 budget approved 400,000 for the grants that have just gone out. Uh, we are looking to she mentioned normally we'll bring this to you in August. August has already passed, so we're, we're playing a little bit of catch up here um, <laughs> with this new change. But so I'm looking for approval for 400,000, so same funding level. Uh, right now, we're allocated towards FY26 uh, as we navigate through this here. So this would be the upcoming cycle that would go into effect pretty much immediately where we start uh, asking for those. Uh, so I'm looking for board approval uh, for $400,000 to put towards the FY26 uh, education workforce development budget. 
Right. Do we I have move, a motion? I move that we. I move. I'll second. Okay. Any discussion? <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Great. Thank you. Thank you. Eddie? On to the next. So, obviously, that uh, outreach season um, has slowed quite a bit, um, but we do have a few highlights from um, the past couple of months, and that was uh, when we were in Pittsburgh in Naseo, um, which was a fantastic conference. Um, and it's a beautiful city, which I was really um, surprised. So, um, so that was that was great. Um, I would also like to add that I was named chair of the Naseo Education Committee as well. Oh, congratulations. congratulations. Thank you. Um, we attended the, well, I attended, um, but Sean had a huge part in this part as well as Dave. Um, the uh, MSU Game Bird um, ribbon cutting um, was in September, I believe. So that was great. Um, even though everyone knows about the Game Bird, it was kind of like the official, like, ah, here it is. Um, so it's such a it's such a gorgeous airplane. So um, Trimby mentioned the Girls in Aviation Day, which was fantastic. Um, we actually used our brand new uh, flight simulator uh, twice um, in the month of September, both at Ames Aviation Day and Girls in Aviation. Um, Kip was able to attend the Ames Aviation Day as well. That was up in Greeley. Uh, but there were a lot of things going on on the same weekend, which was a little bit hard. So it was, we were extend, quite, we were extended, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then uh, I think the last event in September was at Wings Over the Rockies Exploration of Flight, and that was their fire safety showcase. Um, which was very well attended, even though there were only a few apparatus, apparati, yes, <laughs> would be plural, on the ramp. Um, but it was great. We had lots of um, tiny firefighters running around, so as you can see uh, in the picture. There's, and it's very hard to see on here, but there's a, there's one very small person um, in red. She was the fire chief, and yes, I said she wants to be a firefighter. It was fantastic to see that. So um, we have a few more events coming up. Like I said, it's really slowed down. Um, most notably is the Higher Orbits STEM event, which actually is here at CFO in December. Um, and it's uh, called Go for Launch. And they're using space exploration as a platform to launch student involvement in STEM, STEAM, teamwork, um, communication, and leadership. So that'll be really cool. And that's on December 7th and 8th specifically. That's all I have. Who's coming for that event? Is that high schoolers coming? To it is that? grades 8 through 12. Congratulations, Hetty. Thank you. As David has left National Association of State Aviation Official Officials, now we get you on there. Yes. So Colorado representing. Yeah, you, she's been a little bashful. Uh, Hetty has recently taken over as chair of Naseo's Education Committee nationally. She's taking over from her counterpart in North Dakota. So kudos to stepping up to do that. Yeah. Been working every Saturday this summer, it seems like. So. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Congrats. Congrats and thank you. Scott? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a real brief update on the economic impact study. We actually had our uh, twice monthly meeting update with the Kidney Horn team this morning. So everything is on track, moving along as expected. Um, we're hoping here in a couple weeks to have some draft output numbers uh, for us to start reviewing internally uh, so they can move forward with getting those in the final documents. Um, also of note, we've recently reviewed, provided input, and have some templates for our executive summary formats, um, a technical report, the individual airport brochures, and the PowerPoint presentations for each airport. So um, we are assured that we're on track to have most of those products available by Jan uh, January CAOA with the tech full technical report to follow thereafter. So um, we're looking forward to here in the next few months to having some material to provide as an update. Sure. Happy to take any questions you might have. 
So, so Scott, when we roll that, I want to, it's finally done and we roll it out, you know, like I said, hopefully it's CAO. Do, do, what do we do after that? Is there, do we do anything proactive where we send, send it, uh, send it to key stakeholders, like elected officials or have we done that in the past or do we just wait and pass them out? I mean, we do have our project website where everything will be uploaded in the final deliverable. Yeah, I'm talking about when the, when and the, then we share it through his uh, mountain wave and sources. I don't know that we have technically have a widespread political distribution, but uh, definitely goes out to all the aviation people. It's not a cost issue, right? Yeah. No, and so uh, Mark, I think our intent would be, and we've done this previously, we did it five years ago, Sean did a fantastic summary video with all the numbers mm -hmm. that we do on our own, not with Kimberly Horn, uh, and then the idea with getting it out at CAO is we'll be able to share the new numbers at CAO. You know, when we've gone in the past, we've always got all of the information that legislators can see and airports can speak to when they're there at the CAO. We'll do that as well, and then we will make, this time we will do probably a more a concerted effort to get all of that out to some other folks that maybe yeah. weren't either interested or <clears throat> just weren't in our sphere uh, before. And I guess the, the thought path on the way down is it might behoove us to have a letter from both from you and, and from, yeah. from from Kent and send it to the governor, or send it to you know key elected yeah. officials uh, rather than absolutely. You know, Rather than, you know, a push rather than a pull. Yeah. And we I, also uh, rely a lot on, and I'm sorry, Scott, we also rely a lot on, it's one of the reasons Sean publishes the uh, state legislative uh, directory is so that we rely on the airports to help us articulate to yeah. their local elected officials, at least from their local right. airport's perspective. You know, this is why our personal airport is so important and here's our economic impact. So that's, we put those two together at CAO way and airports are a big part of our team to help articulate that. It's a great opportunity because, you know, we, yeah. you know, as, as I've said, they, Times and we all agree it's it's an important tool um, to help educate, especially those that are you know, not um, very aviation focused or savvy. So, yeah, and I don't push I it. Don't know that we did it in, in the last time, but we could maybe work with our state groups to maybe do a press a broader press release than what Sean promoted. No, you know, and, and sending it out to you know Sean to absolutely you know, the different media outlets instead so of so just us saying, hey, we got. Go to the website and download it. Oh, thank, thank you. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Digital Tower, Mr. Payne. Well, we'll actually skip back to 11.3, Mr. Chair, the NREL alternative. <laughs> I am just, uh, no, that's okay. I, it's, it's not my it, day. It's, it's all right. right. We'll keep you on the it's all the drugs he's on. It's all good. I, uh, I am not Scott Carey, quite clearly. Unfortunately, Scott from uh, NREL is unable to be here today. But just very quickly, as I mentioned earlier, they're just about near the end of the uh, report. It's currently being circulated internal to NREL and the Department of Energy for some internal review. Hopefully, we'll have a draft here in the next uh, four to five weeks or so. We'll share that with all of you for uh, your input. We'll give that back to NREL and then we will get the final report out hopefully uh, shortly after the first of the year. So that's your quick study on NREL. And then like I said in our strategic plan, we'll take a look at that and see where you all think we ought to go next with that information and uh, what we ought to start looking at. So that's the quick update on our NREL alternatively powered aircraft study. Thank you, Dave. Mr. Payne. I'm not Mr. Payne either. I'm going to cover for him. <laughs> so uh, Bill is traveling overseas. He regrets that he was not able to be here today, but uh, that project continues to go uh, pretty well. There's not anything really happening at FNL right now, as you all know. Um, right now with uh, Frequentis, who is the uh, group that the FAA has selected to go back and demonstrate the remote tower, digital tower technology back at the tech center per their new approach. They've uh, gotten that information, that information, that equipment was installed in July and was optimized and the site acceptance testing is expected to start next month. So really what we're kind of in right now is a little bit of a hiatus here at FNL, why they work through this process at the tech center. And then when they get to the end, at the end of um, uh, the system design approval process in the spring, they will start looking per the FA reauthorization bill. You'll recall, you'll recall we got that great language in there that once they do this, they've got to come to an airport where there's already been a digital tower. And that's from Leesburg and they've given up 
and that's us. So the good news is they'll be back to FNL, and the FAA has already uh, given us uh, very strong indications that FNL will be the airport uh, that they will come back to. And so, uh, again, kudos to Senator Hickenlooper for helping us get that language in. The FAA reauthorization will be very beneficial for us in that. So um, the other thing we've been working very hard on, you know, Bill's talked about it for several months, we are continuing to press the FAA to allow the STARS radar fee that is in the, t in the digital tower to be used in the mobile tower so they have better situational awareness, better safety. Um, I won't get on Bill's soapbox about why that's such a big deal. You all know that it is. But um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, Congressman Lopez, on behalf of the airport, wrote to the FAA and said, we think you ought to do this as well. And the senators have already sent similar letters previously. So um, we'll keep you on track with that. So again, not a lot going on at FNL, um, but we'll have more to share here, I think, uh, early next year. So. And one question on that, Dave, um, how is the airspace around NOCO now? Is it is it Delta when the tower is operational? Really unique. It's Tower Class Echo. Okay, interesting. Which is kind of interesting, and I, that's kind of a unicorn within the airspace. I had to look it up. <laughs> yeah, I, I was in flight following, yeah. and they asked me to avoid the Echo airspace uh -huh. at NOCO, and that, that right. was kind of a... It, it has a lot to do with the temporary nature of it, uh, because they don't, as I've understood it from, this is from many years ago, they typically do not allocate Class Delta airspace to a temporary tower, which is what that interesting. is. Interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. Control class echo. Didn't even know a thing like that. Or tower class echo. Didn't know that. Okay. I have a question, Dave. Sure. Weren't they going to change the name from digital tower to virtual tower? So what happened that, to that? So we, it, it's been through a bunch of different names. First, it was called blended airspace. And it was called virtual tower. The vernacular globally has really centered, I think, on digital. So we had been calling it out here, but to sort of align our terminology with what the companies are calling it, what other um, airspace providers around the world are calling it. We changed it to Digital Tower about the time that Sea Ridge decided to eject from the project. So same thing, I still have, I still call a remote tower just like I still call this front range airport. Um, Kenny called it Jeffco earlier. Come on, Kenny, it's not been Jeffco. <laughs> I know. Some of that stuff dies fast, but that's the reason for the, the terminology change. Great. Uh, Caitlin? I have lots of fun stuff to talk about surplus, but I'll be quick. So this year's surplus sale was another huge success. Um, Mark was admiring the one at Leadville. Leadville has been someone that had, the county has been very supportive of the project over and over again. They're also wonderful um, ambassadors for everyone that comes through to tell them about the program. And they are very good at educating their employees on how the program works. The very first time I stepped in, this is probably three, three airport managers ago at Leadville, I walked in and there was a new kid sitting behind the counter. And I said, how's everything going? He said, well, the the broom just broke down on the dam road. And I said, which broom? And he said, the one we bought from Surplus. And I said, which dam? And he said, the Turquoise Lake Dam. And I kind of cocked my head to the side. And he said, we've had it for more than two years. And I said, okay. <laughs> so Leadville not only is it good, they promote the program, but they, they're using it locally to support the rest of the county stuff as well, which is amazing. Um, they have also told those stories to other cities and counties, and they're doing the same thing. So with Denver's amazing partnership, um, this, this picture was actually taken on top of the ARF truck, which gave us a pretty cool view of those multifunction units across to the um, to the terminal. It was a really, really neat spot to watch not only the airfield action, but all the stuff that was going on at the surplus preview. We had 21 pieces sell this year for a total uh, total sale of 817,500, which is very different than last year's because last year we sold 53 pieces for just over a million. So the mix of equipment was very different this year. We had a lot of big multi-use pieces of equipment. So we had a lot of mountain airports and bigger airports on this side of the continental divide that were interested, but a lot of the smaller um, planes of airports were not as pleased at the outpouring of equipment because obviously they don't need those giant pieces of equipment. So it's neat that it kind of ebbs and flows based on the needs and the airports. So we see a different sprinkle of airports every year that participate. Colorado Springs had a few pieces sell. They had two pieces sell of the 21 this year. Um, I am very happy to report that as of Yes, Monday. All of the grants have been, Denver's been paid for everything. Colorado Springs has been paid for everything. Um, everyone has submitted their <laughs> reimbursement requests to me and they're all closed, paid and closed. So 
a pretty awesome feat for us to get done that quickly. Last year's was a giant lift with the number of airports we had, but it made us make our process that much more efficient. So this year was pretty was pretty great. I couldn't do it with the help of all of, all of my coworkers that come and help the day of the sale, but uh, I don't have to tell you how passionate I am about this program. I I have to contain myself quite a bit about it, but um, I, I can't thank you enough for your support of this program because it does have impacts to every corner of the state. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay, legislative updates. Sure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think I'll focus uh, this month just very quickly on the implementation of House Bill 1235. Um, as I noted a little bit earlier, uh, Todd and the planning team have just done a fantastic job of updating all of the application processes and, and uh, forms within WIMS to make sure that all of the things we need to collect and gather and certify for grants going forward are in WIMS. That's done. So we're very happy about that. Um, we've worked very closely with Barbara and the JAG's office. They've been very helpful in helping us make sure that when we are looking at the language and some of it gave us a little attitude to do certain things like I identify the impacted airports. We did that in collaboration with her, make sure we're kind of thinking on the same page. And so again, uh, you know, the bill required us to identify busy general aviation airports that um, are having impacts on their communities. Looking at the bill, we identified uh, Rocky Mountain Metro, Centennial, Erie, Boulder, and Longmont. No surprise. I think that's uh, everybody has, has been on the same page with that. So those are the five airports that per the bill for this next grant cycle will be required to uh, provide us with the voluntary noise abatement programs that meet several elements outlined in the bill. We have put together both an internal checklist for our team to make sure that when an airport submits that plan, we can go right to the bill and say, check, check, uh, maybe not, check. Um, we've also provided that checklist back to the airports clear back in August, so they have a lot of time to update their plans if they needed to. Um, back in August, we had a meeting in this room. It was basically mandatory. If you wanted to grant from us, you needed to show your smile and face in this room. And we met with the airport directors from all five of those airports and went through it piece by piece. So they could not say that they did not know what they had to do to, uh, you know, to comply with the bill and make sure that we were doing what we needed to do when we all and you all consider grants for next period. So um, on October 1st, a couple of weeks ago, um, Chair Holsinger and I had an opportunity to join Emily Hathaway, who is CDOT's legislative legislative liaison to brief Representative Kyle Brown, the primary sponsor of the bill and his legislative aid on where we were at. We have put together very detailed implementation plans on who's responsible for what, demonstrating where we've implemented certain things. We shared those with the representative and I certainly don't want to put Representative Brown on the spot, but Representative, I see you're on our meeting and I might see if you have anything to add or maybe any questions that you might have of this particular issue. I know we met with you a couple of weeks ago, but Hate to put you on the spot, but I see you on the list there. Thanks, David. This is actually Matt, his aide. Uh, oh. <laughs> nothing to add, but just wanted to listen and see how things were going. Okay. Thanks, Matt. And I might add that uh, the representative um, could not have been more complimentary to Dave uh, and the division for all the hard work they put into implementing, in, implementing the legislation. And I appreciate that. And then just another quick update. I did meet with the governor's office of boards and commission director uh, a couple of days ago. They're still working through some of their um, applicants that they have for the two new community board members that will join us in December. Um, Kent and I have a meeting here uh, at the beginning of November with Jennifer Shea. She is the ex officio representative that CDPHE has put forward. That one does not require um, the governor's appointment because it's one that CDPHE puts forward. So we'll look forward to meeting her. And then, as you all know, Mr. Bampa, this is his uh, penultimate meeting here. He's got one more meeting and then he turns out. So we'll have a new Western Slope representative. And then Daniel's term is also up for a potential renewal as well. And then, uh, as you all know, the second Eastern Plains airport position has been vacant since Chaz retired a few months ago. So that will get appointed in December as well. So uh, typically the governor's office will have identified their appointees probably the mid-November time frame at the latest, it moves a little bit each year based on what else is going on. But obviously as those move forward and we find out who those folks are, I'll, I'll keep you all posted. That's all I have for that, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dave. Uh, how about the proposed calendar? All right, so our next regular meeting will be here at the division offices on Wednesday, December 11th. So please 
uh, mark your calendars for that. Again, just as a reminder, that's where we will preview the state and local grant uh, hearing that you all have in January, just like always. So our January meeting, first meeting of the new year, that will be the first meeting that our new board members mm -hmm. uh, will join us because the board member terms expire on the 19th. We've always met on the second Wednesday, so that's why they, they, I'm sure they'll be here because they will know who they are, but they will not officially be on the board yet. Um, so Tuesday, January. Well, I'm sorry. sorry on that. So we'll we'll be meeting on the 29th, Wednesday the 29th. No, Wednesday the 11th of December. Um, but for the January meeting. Oh, that is on Tuesday the 28th. Okay. Yeah. So that will be again with CAOA. Don't have the time yet as CAOA gets their agenda fleshed out a little closer. We'll let you know what time. Typically, it's in the morning, about 10. Uh, we'll see how that works. And then uh, also at that meeting, as we always do, that'll be the approval of the state and local grants for 2025. So that's the calendar looking forward. Thank you. Okay, other matters? Hearing none, uh, let's move on to executive session. Would y'all like to take a break first? A break would be fine. Can I rephrase that? Can I take a break? <laughs> <laughs> you may. I'm, I'm going to work on my Christopher Walken. Next. Okay, you work on that. <laughs> Imitation. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Right up front. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 